Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! Yes, 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 it's my favorite time of the day. Critic, I don't think the girls in the 90s wore this many hair products. I look like Punky Brewster's recycling bin. And why are my pants this baggy? Also, why are all the logos on the back? It's all part of the experience. Now sit down before it starts. Before what starts? You're just pressing play on the DVD player. You don't understand. This is the Disney afternoon. There's a certain ritual to this. We act like we just got back from school, throw our belongings on the ground for our mothers to pick up, surround ourselves in high fructose corn syrup, and reward ourselves for dealing with the mental scars of our tremendously flawed education system. Wait, are, aren't you talking about Disney's One Saturday Morning on ABC? Fuck Disney's One Saturday Morning on ABC! That was just a carbon copy cartoon cock comparison compared to the Disney afternoon. Hey, Pepper Ann was good. Okay, maybe one. And Recess was decent. Yeah, if you want to get technical. And Kim Possible? Well, Kim Possible, obviously, but And I, Proud Family? Who's this in the Proud Family? Nobody dissed the Proud Family while I'm around! And there was also that other show, um, Doug. Yeah, that was a pretty good cartoon series. You can't deny that must have had some sort of impact on your life. What you're both missing is that the Disney afternoon had a timeless sense of magic and wonder that was the perfect welcome home from a long day of schoolhouse popularity or awkward social punishment. So, if there's no other comparisons to lesser forms of art... I can't feel my teeth. We'll go ahead and get started. For the first time ever from 1990 to 1997, Disney took some of its hit syndicated shows and ran them with all new material in a two hour block called the Disney Afternoon. Sure, there were some reruns and specials featuring the old classic Disney cartoons before then, but this was the first time Disney put a slew of new programming back to back in one glorious lineup. Most of it timeless, some of it not so much, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Let's look at Disney's first installment, Gummy Bear. Gummy Bear. And yes, the first thing you're thinking pops into everybody else's head too. Why and or how do you make a show based on a fruit snack whose head and limbs you disturbingly bite off? Well, despite such a distracting commercial tie-in, the show surprisingly wasn't that bad. A lot of that had to deal with its bright colors, fantasy-focused environment, and a theme song sung by the most easily excitable group ever. Just listen to how into it these guys get. It's impossible not to get sucked in yourself. That's beyond compare. They are the gummy bears. Magic and mystery are part of their history, along with the secret of gummy berry juice. The legend is growing. They take pride in knowing the fight for what's right. And whatever they do, gummy bears bouncing here and there and there. In fact, the singer actually died on that very last note. He was that into it. They are the gummy bears. The show centers around a boy named Cap'n. He lives in a kingdom trying to be conquered by a group of ogres led by the egotistical Duke. King Gregor's castle will be nothing but a big pile of gravel. Get moving! Time is money, or it would be if I were paying you. Truth be told, I always thought the Duke through most of my childhood was just Skeletor before he lost his flesh. In fact, maybe this all takes place in the same universe and Skeletor is just the Duke's ghost. Tomorrow! The world! Uh oh. No, damn it! Now what flamboyant spectacle am I going to chase? Hello? Kevin stumbles across the group of enchanted serial mascots and learns of their secret weapon that can defeat the Duke, a liquid that gives them super strength and jumping abilities called Gummy Berry Juice. Gummy Berry Juice. Gummy Berry Juice. Gummy Berry Juice. You know, couldn't you come up with a better name for such a gigantic source of power? Wouldn't the Force lose a little bit of its magic if it was called something different? You must use the yummy Muffy Puffy. Right. So it's a constant battle between our lovable plush toys and the evil monsters and sorcerers that plague the land. The show had an innocence to it that made it silly but still pretty enjoyable. But maybe a lot of the show's intrigue came from the fact that it sounded like most of the bears ate your favorite cartoon characters. Like Garfield. He's more homesick than we are. Tigger. Oh no, oh no, a cart not cubby. That's just the story. Natasha. Crafty Gummy, you have the manners of a billy goat. Tony Curtis. Don't you tell me who I like and who I don't like. 
and of course, Nicolas Cage. This is the way the teddy bears have their picnic, bitch. <laughs> Honestly, the show works so surprisingly well, I'm kind of wondering if Disney maybe should consider doing other shows based on bite-sized treats. Doritos, getting cheese crumbs on your goddamn clothes. They are the Doritos. They are the gummy bears. But that was only the first show in the lineup. Next was the always popular DT. Why don't you just say the title? Because I have literally, 24 years after its release, have just now gotten the theme song out of my head and I don't want to risk putting it back in my head by possibly saying the title once more. You mean DuckTales? DuckTales, you. As you know, I've talked about this show several times in the past on both my Raiders of the Story arc and, of course, my top 11 catchiest themes. Should we call it Ambulance? It's too late for him, so I won't waste too much time on this one. But we can talk a little bit about it. The show centered around Scrooge McDuck looking after Huey, Dewey, and Louie as their parents once again refuse to take any responsibility for them, and all the adventures and crazy characters they encounter finding treasure. It's sort of like Indiana Jones meets... Duckula. Does anyone remember that? I don't care. Despite the fact that the focus of the story is continuing to reward the 1%, the show still kicks ass even years later, giving us all sorts of memorable secondary characters, like Launchpad, that witch duck, that inventor duck, the chubby woodchuck duck, and Robo Duck. Hey, I said the characters were memorable, not the names. It's still smart, it's still creative, and it's still incredibly likable. It has just as much charm now as it did back then. But surely there must be another Disney title that also made a thumb bleedingly good Capcom game? <laughs> we're talking. Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers was the famous chipmunk duo forming a team to help and save anyone in danger. Think of them as an anti-Pinky and the Brain. I'm Chip, and I'm Dale! You know Chip and Dale, of course, but on top of that there was Gadget, Zipper, and Monterey Jack. And while these characters were memorable and extremely likable, it did suddenly make me realize the traditional team formula that lingered over most kids' shows. For example, you have the inventor, you have the muscle, you have the leader, you have the goof-off, and of course, the little cute one that's just so darn adorable. But let's be fair, this is when that formula was just starting to be put into effect. And give the show credit for putting two popular characters on a team instead of just keeping it two people whose real voices sound like Babs, Bunny, and the crazy taxi guy fighting over the same woman. I gotta hand it to you, Gadget. You were right about Tom after all. I always believed in you. <sighs> Most of their time was spent fighting off evil schemes, usually from the diabolical fat cat. Hello, my galvanized feline friend. And surprisingly, he has no political tie-ins, despite the fact that his name is, in fact, Fat Cat. Though I guess he does look a touch like Christopher Christie. My million dollar dinner, gone down the drain! While we're on the subject, did you know that Chip and Dale were actually modeled after Indiana Jones and Magnum P.I.? God, wouldn't that been a totally different show if it matched their personalities too? You stood up to be countered with the enemy of everything that the Grail stands for. Who gives a damn what you think? Hey, did you come here just to abuse me? The characters allow for a lot of inventive storylines and ideas. Like Gadget, being the Roan equivalent of MacGyver. I mean, good God, just look at half the things she makes. Gee, Gadget, did you bring me breaks on this thing? Don't be silly, Chip. Of course I did. But they fell off a few blocks back. Hey, Tamara, can you make a car out of a skateboard and a hairdryer? No. All I can do is a Chevy pickup truck sculpted out of rubber and ice. You're not also the craft! A lot of characters lent their way to learning some good lessons, too. Like, always be yourself, have confidence in your work, don't join cults. Yeah, there was actually an episode about the dangers of following a cult. And I, I think like most kids around my age, found out what a cult was by watching this episode. Hey, it's better than finding out other ways. He had more cheese wedges than he could count, but he's far richer in spirit now that he's giving up all his wealth to be fizzed. It's actually pretty clever social satire. A group of mice mistake a cola commercial, you know, the ones that always say you don't belong unless you buy our product, and they turn it into a literal interpretation. Ah, we were all lost once before we found the cola cult. And I'll be damned if I can't remember one algebraic equation from all my days of school, but yet years later, I still remember every fucking 
fucking word of the Cuckoo Cola song. Come along, you belong to the fizz of Cuckoo Cola. Get to the store and take all you can carry. Ah, 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 ah. You belong with Cuckoo Cola. It was cute, it was clever, it had characters we could never forget. It was a whole lot of fun. After Chip and Dale wrapped up, we then moved on to a show with a familiar character who's a bumbling pilot with his gigantic plane and the timeless environment that he inhabited. I'm talking, of course, about The Jungle Book. Tailspin is arguably one of the stranger's setups. Not because of the plot itself about a delivery pilot who battles air pirates along with his sidekick Kit, but... Why the Jungle Book characters? It's like having the cast of Bambi in a film noir. It doesn't add up. Well, maybe part of it is that, surprisingly, Jungle Book after inflation was the fourth highest grossing Disney film at that time. So I guess they figured it made sense to give them their own show. But even then, there's only three characters that ever made it in, Baloo, Louie, and Shere Khan. Where are the other guys? Wouldn't it be great to see Ka in there? Or Ka? But then again, to their credit, maybe that's all they needed, as the rest of the characters stood on their own quite nicely. Kid was sort of the everyday kid you wanted to be, especially when he was flying around on that glider thing. He's kind of like an adorable green goblin. I mean, more adorable than he already is. Blue told me never to talk to strangers, and I've never met anybody stranger than you! Cute kid! There was Rebecca, who ran the business, who a lot of people didn't like, but honestly, I think she's a perfect comic foil. Just look at all these reactions when Baloo tries to disguise his friend as a scientist. Guten Tag, bon join, how you doing? What are you doing in that getup? Ugh, you have me confused with someone entirely not myself. I'm Dr. Sven Philippe Gesundheit, BVD. You mean PhD? Oh, that, that, that too. She even plays along in finding ways to teach Baloo a lesson for trying such a lazy scheme. Hi! Just checking to see if you've landed on my. Yet. Yeah, and it's bedtime here. You should be out there exploring, collecting specimens. Now don't you dare come back without a cargo hold full of plants and animals. Oh, and while I have you... I don't know. She never bothered me. What did bother me, though, was her kid, Molly, who is sort of like a webby 2.0. I'm not Molly. I'm Danger Woman. Here to inspect my secret headquarters. She was just as annoying, just as cutesily pandering, and just as inconsistent in her appearances. Sometimes Rebecca needed a sitter for her, other times she was nowhere to be seen. Where the hell she go in the middle of those episodes? I think she was just an unused gummy bear that they decided to fit in somewhere. You stay away from my mommy! Ow! Molly! Needless to say, any episode centered around her definitely needed more air missiles falling in her direction. Just wait till you tune in next week. Same danger time. Same danger time. And then, of course, there's Don Carnage. Don Carnage knows all that a feared pirate needs to know, you know? Oh. How does one describe Don Carnage? Imagine if Ricky Ricardo got fed up with his wife, took his Caribbean band, and just started robbing the shit out of people. You got pretty much as hilarious a villain as you can conceive. Catch me the nasty bird, idiot! You are my worm for catching the early bird! <laughs> what a lousy place for a wall. How is it this guy never got a spin-off show? He's fucking hilarious! And I know what you're thinking, yeah, he's a pirate, he's a bad guy, so that would be good for kids, but hey, pirates were kind of the first forms of democracy. I mean, come on, all his pirates have different accents, and hell, I think Don Carnage has like eight different accents in his one voice. You had better get that annoying bird back here if you ever want to see sociable insecurity. It's teaching kids about being together with all sorts of different races, even if you are a million different races in one somehow. It can work. Disney, make it happen. Oh, little britches. Say it isn't so. For such a strange combination of characters and timelines, Tailspin had a great feel, charming characters, and enough air battles to keep any kid happy. <laughs> but sadly, this would spell the end for Disney's phenomenal run. What? You didn't like Darkwing Duck? How dare you indicate I don't like Darkwing Duck! Do I have to get out my people who don't like Darkwing Duck gun? 
was talking about the fact that they never did a good Disney afternoon and Capcom game again. I mean, come on. Baloo's head is the size of the plane? That's just dumb. Well then why don't you just explain what Darkwing Duck is for those who don't know? Which is obviously not me. Darkwing Duck! When there's trouble you call the dummy! Darkwing Duck! He is the terror that flaps in the night! He is the noun that verbs your other noun! He is Darkwing Duck! Yeah, a funny superhero was really nothing new. But part of what made Darkwing Duck so great was that majority of the time, he wasn't doing it because he thought it was right. He did it for the exact opposite reason any superhero should. He did it for fame and fortune. Really think about that. We've seen a ton of egotistical funny villains, but Disney has never really had a hero that was full of himself constantly looking for attention, and even sometimes endangering the mission so that he can get all the glory. I had it all under control! Let me guess, you've come to hell. Everyone jumping on my crime-fighting bandwagon. I'm not flying anywhere with Laughing Boy here! Yeah, we've had a side character here or there, but this is a main character, a main Disney character, the focus of good morals. And yet he constantly comes across as 100% egotistical in every single scene he's in. He even provides his own narrations out loud like a little kid. He had washed the city clean of crime like a, a damp mop. No, that's not very dramatic. But maybe that's why we indulged him so much. It wasn't as much a nasty need for attention as much as like a little kid looking for attention. Trying to be the center by being the hero and technically following his dreams. Even if it is misguided, it's still well-meaning. I should have worked with the team. But Dad, the team needs you. They've been captured. Oh, perfect. Some team they turned out to be. I guess I'll have to go save them. He, of course, had side characters, like an excitable tomboy daughter named Gosselin, the return of DuckTales character Launchpad, Fake? Wrestling's fake? And a slew of pretty inventive baddies, including a shocking rodent named Megavolt, a crime boss named Steelbeak, who I always thought was foulmouth grown up. Maybe he lost his beak by swearing to Colombian drug lords or something. And his arch nemesis, Negaduck. That's the end of Darkwing Duck. Little known fact, Jim Cummings' voice as Negaduck kills five puppies every single time he speaks. Uh -huh. I get the loot. Why? Because I said... Oh, oh yeah, that makes you sense. put it that way. Also, in my opinion, Darkwing was the first time we had a legitimately unique kid character in the Disney afternoon. Not that the past ones were bad, but they were just kind of the typical nice kind of troublemaking generic kids. There is only one Gosselin. She is wild, she is funny, she is always part of the action. You'll get your own comic book out of it. You better call up Winnie the Ghoul right now. You are taking that wine down, are you, Launchpad? <laughs> oh, guess you are. And she compliments Darkwing perfectly, seeing how he has the dreams and ego of a little kid, and she literally is a little kid. So there's a legitimate connection as well as an arc for him to learn how to be a parent. Wherever there's an evildoer evildoing, I'll be there. Great, Dad. The show was also great at satirizing everything superhero-oriented, while still being its own thing. How many of those analogies did he make up to describe how fearsome he is? I am the metal key on the sardine can of justice! I am the hair in the lens of your projector! I am the wrong number that wakes you at 3 a.m. I am the parking meter that expires while you shop. I am the tube of cadmium yellow that's impossible to open. Darkwing Duck was one of the Disney Afternoon's best shows ever. Let's get dangerous. Before, sadly, it's inevitable decline. Decline? What do you mean, decline? Well, like any ongoing series that we love, what goes up must eventually come down. But we'll worry about that in the second half. For now, what do you say we all watch commercials while eating some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fruit snacks? Ew, you held on to those since the 90s? Oh no, they're current. Oh, well, heck with that. I'm gonna reconnect with My Little Pony. Oh, you held on to that since childhood? No, it's... Current. Well, I'm gonna reconnect with my nostalgia by playing with my Transformer. Did you get that out of your attic? No. It's current. Well, let's do something that's not current by watching children's cartoons while talking over them. Nothing.
it's changed. All right, so you're saying that the Disney afternoon went downhill after Darkwing Duck. Does that mean you hate Goof Troop? No! Oh, good. Ish. Goof Troop by no means is a bad show. It's aired around Goofy and his son Max living in suburbia next to Pete and his family, PJ, Peg, and Pistol. It still had a lot of funny characters, humorous situations, and a big deal of heart. But this is back when Disney was trying to be... KILL! Yeah. Just look at this music video that premiered with the first episode, and tell me you're not getting that vibe. Oh yeah, all the kids are gonna be doing the... Goofy this week. I get the feeling the Mad Hatter's gonna steal a move or two from this. This is total jigginess. Aside from maybe Kit wearing a backwards hat, which even then you could argue keeps the hat on better ways flying, the past Disney shows had a timeless feel, just trying to tell good stories with good characters. And aside from this... Wonder Bread, there's still this very strong indication that Goof Troop was the first time the Disney afternoon was trying to be hip and with it. Give him the shades, have him ride a skateboard, have him be totally embarrassed by his dorky dad because the 90s are so anti-authority. Bubble tape is not part of a well-balanced diet. Because of that, Max is not exactly the most interesting character. He's sort of just some 90s stereotype kid we saw in most shows and movies around then. No problem, first step. 200 Gorilla Burger. He's cool, but he can screw up. He has attitude, but possesses a good heart. He has a rocket hairstyle, baggy clothes, and he's into anything that's extreme. I feel like I'm losing the cherry on my Sunday, the foam on my root beer. But to the show's credit, he's not annoying per se. There's just not much to him. For me, the real focus of the show was on Pete's family. I wish the show was just based on these guys. This is where the real comedy gold was. Playing sick, eh? Well, you can't fool me, see? I was a fool way before you were born. You have an overbearing father, a completely neurotic son, a half-kind but half-threatening mother, and a psychotic little daughter. Seriously, who needs their kid pistol? Now go out there and uphold the family IQ. I loved these guys. I wanted more of them. In fact, why couldn't they have the title of the show? Call it Pete Beat. Okay, title needs to work, but you get the idea. I think because shows like Home Improvement and Family Matters were just as popular with kids as they were with adults, there's this big push to throw away the wild imaginative worlds and stick to the all too comforting, all too boring realms of suburbia. And what fun is that in an animated show? At least for kids. I mean, what kind of adventures ever happen in suburbia? <laughs> Except that. But again, as everyday cartoon shows go, Goof Troop still got a few laughs and had enough enjoyable characters to keep it afloat. Yeah. Bonkers, on the other hand. While more city-based than suburban-based, Bonkers' problem wasn't that the location was horrendously passé, it's that the idea was horrendously passé. Now, tell me if this setup sounds familiar. <clears throat> A tune at a cop. Roger Rabbit. Yeah! You don't really need an explanation after that, do you? As soon as you throw in a tune and a cop, that's the first thing you're gonna think of. But hey, maybe it'll be cool. Like, remember how great it was to see all those famous cartoon characters walking around? With Disney's endless library of unforgettables, surely we'll see some of them here, right? Well... I saw the Mad Hatter in the opening. I saw Dumbo for a second. They're watching Darkwing Duck on TV. That doesn't count! 
And literally, there's a whole episode where Mickey Mouse is kept in a carrier cage the whole time, and you never see him. And I mean, never see him. Roll over, boy! <laughs> Roll over! Beat your cage! Okay, here's a hard one! Play dead! What, the, the, what is the purpose of having Mickey Mouse on your show if you're never going to show him? Did Mickey just want more money? Will he not come out of his trailer unless they doubled his salary? Tell those sons of bitches unless they want to animate a fifth finger for me to flick him off! I want more dough! Huh? And surely bonkers, the main character of the show would in no way be so annoying you'd rather smash a hammer against your ears to experience a more pleasant sound. Electrocute me, burn me to a crisp, and blow up the police station? Where did I go wrong? Oh, how did I fail my pet? Oh. Oh. Bonkers was kind of like a mix between the Garbage Pail Kids and Snarf, yet somehow they thought audiences would want to return to this. We have to go to Corkscrew and I'm nasty and poster. How could those little monsters do this to me? I trusted them! Even the side characters, one of them being a stick-in-the-mud cop who has no sense of humor... Roger, Roger Rabbit. Rabbit. I know, I know! It's a little confusing because at least in Roger Rabbit, it was live action and animation. Here, it's all animation! So the wonder if it doesn't really stick out. I mean, yeah, you get the idea that all the drawn people are supposed to be real people, but let's say they come across a cartoon of Aladdin. You wouldn't know which one was supposed to be the tune and which one was supposed to be real, would ya? Which is why, I'm sorry to say, kids, there will never be an Aladdin and Bonkers crossover. Aww. Even Animaniacs, who share the same time slot, took a pretty mean dig at it every once in a while. Ah, no wonder you like that bonkers show. That junk's rotting out your brain there. It wasn't funny, it wasn't creative, pretty much everything about it had already been done before. It was a show that was in desperate need of an eraser. Wherever you are! And thus, Disney would never do anything different, anything original, or anything groundbreaking ever again. Okay, why? Gargoyles like DuckTales I've talked about many times before, so I won't dwell too much. But looking back at the other shows Disney was turning out and how safe they were playing it for a while, it hit me more and more just what a unique risk Gargoyles kind of was for them. It was their first straight on serious show. And their TV animation, which hadn't really done anything quite this heavy or dramatic, stepped up its act and really gave something that Disney shows weren't doing at that time. And debatably, haven't really done since. It didn't need a hip-hop theme song or popular catchphrases to be badass. It just had to be badass to be badass. And that came from its strong heroes, its complex villains, and its dark grim style. Also, half the cast of every Star Trek series ever made helps too. It was a fantastic show, and we loved every single minute of it. Why? Because never once did it ever rely on any sort of cheap Disney gimmicks. We had Aladdin for that. Arabian nights, like Arabian days. I'll try not to step on too many toes, as I know a lot of people like this show. And in all fairness, it's not a bad idea for a show. Aladdin offered a lot of great scenarios that could be taken right out of Arabian Nights, and I'll also give kudos that I actually do remember a lot of the characters they created. I remember Abi, Small, Mirage, Sadira, Chaos, that other Aladdin with the girly lips. These were all cool creations that left memorable impressions. Strangely enough, the problems with the show were more centered on the main characters, even though their popularity had already made a ton of money in the past. But let's be honest, what made a lot of the original movies so great was its imagination and its humor. Here, we have the imagination, but instead of Robin Williams' improvisations, we get... Hold it! Did you risk a boo on a bet? You must show respect to the Simeon family. Homer Simpson bombing at stand-up. And yes, that is Homer's voice, Dan Castellaneta, clearly giving it his all. But the scripts he's handed gives him very little to work with. Aladdin and Jasmine are strong enough to hold a movie, but here, they're so bland you could replace them with an empty shell and Michael Eisner saying, That's you! You're doing that! The monkey still sounds like a choking Donald Duck, and by Jesus on Broadway, there is way too much Gilbert Godfrey on this show! Could we leave the bird a little dignity? My 
must be that new cream rinse I'm using. And a fish mole fries my gizzard! Why do people keep casting me as irritatingly annoying birds? The animation too is a little strange, as half of it's trying to be realistic like gargoyles, but then the other half is trying to be cartoony like bonkers. So you end up with big expressionless eyes on what looks like stretchy erasers. Look at these, they look more like flesh colored Play-Doh than they do Aladdin. I'm not even sure it makes sense. In the movie they say they have to marry in three days, but they're still not hitched in the show. And if Aladdin is allowed to live in the palace now, how come he's still wearing the clothes he wore as a thief? Does Jasmine just really like the Middle Eastern male stripper look? I guess as a show based on a movie goes, it could have been a lot worse, but trying to capture that Disney movie feel seems to work better when you can expand with your main characters, not be restricted by them. God, he looks unnatural. Come on down, stop on by. Hop a carpet and fly to another Arabian night. But not all Disney shows based on Disney movies have to be bad. They just have to have annoying themes. Hakuna Matata! There's not really too much to say about Timon and Pumbaa either. Not because it's bad, on the contrary, it delivers exactly what it promises. It's Timon and Pumbaa in hijinks, goofy situations, and silly scenarios. And that's about all you needed, and that's about all delivered. The animation was fine, the timing was decent, and it never felt like it had to be too restricted to their environment. They could still do fun cartoony things that fun cartoons usually do. It's totally serviceable. Hell, I dare even say they're a lot funnier here than they are in the movie. Hakuna Matata! Timon and Pumbaa! But sadly, for every Timon and Pumbaa, there's a Schnookums and Meat. Schnookums and what? Yeah, I don't remember that. Well, that's because we're starting to get into the half season. You see, as the Disney afternoon started to lose its audience, it took one of their time slots and would constantly alternate in between shows. So Tuesday at 4 might be bonkers, but Wednesday at 4 could be gargoyles, and Friday at 4 could be Legend of Zelda. I mean schnookums and meat. This was part of their attempt to just throw stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And did schnookums and meat stick? If by stick you mean I like to impale them on something very sharp, just look at this intro and tell me if it reminds you of anything. Anything familiar at all. Red and Stimpy. <laughs> if you thought Bonkers ripping off Roger Rabbit was bad, this was just uncomfortable. From the surreal animation to the paint drop backgrounds to the semi-realistic stills to the fact that it's a cat and a goddamn dog, it was pretty fucking painful. It's like watching a kid dance well and then another less talented kid says he can do the same thing and then ends up copying a terrible cartoon show. And let me tell you, if you thought Bonkers was annoying, take a listen to this. I protect the house from intruders. Oh yeah? Well I think you're too stupid to know otherwise. Okay. I am not stupid. I am not stupid. I am not stupid. Hey, did you hit him again? No, I think he's just reacting to the sound of their voices. So horrible! The animation is still Disney too, and even though they're trying to be different, it's still clearly out of their comfort zone. It still looks a little too polished and safe to be anything like the all-out insanity that Ren and Stimpy gave us. The creator of the show went on to do Eek the Cat, which also had a Ren and Stimpy feel, but was still unique enough to be called its own show. This is the equivalent of a video game reviewer seeing another video game reviewer and trying to do exactly the same thing but not even coming close to fill in your own punchline here. But as bad as this is, it still doesn't compare to the final two shows desperate enough to cash in on what Disney considered at the time MAJOR ATTITUDENESS. What show is that? Quack Pack. I feel like quacking, so I think I will. You know how Goof Troop kind of exploited speaking the language of our personality deprived youth? Well, Quack Pack is the fucking parade for it. Just look at this intro. Strips? Why, that's not current and hip! Oh yeah, now this is current and hip! Huey, Dewey, and Louie! Oh, I mean... Extreme Huey, Dewey, and Louie! Quack! Quack back! This'll teach that unhip adult not to be 15 years younger! Take that, not us! Yeah! 
song sounds ridiculous, and I'm including by Disney standards. I feel like cracking, so I think I will. What the hell does that mean? Who wakes up and says, I feel like quacking today? Did I miss that thing? Did I miss that thing? And there's your first problem. How do you make anyone called Huey, Dewey, and Louie cool? Well, I think the thought process is just to take the most popular of the three Home Improvement Boys and just make three of them. No, I'm not even kidding. These kids have no personalities outside of Jonathan Taylor Thomas quotes and 90s poses. Oh, don't know what 90s poses are? I'll give you a run through. The I don't care pranksters. The I don't care belly layers. The I don't care arms folded and or hands in pockets. The I don't care shrug, followed by the I don't care resting hands behind my head. And the constant, constant I don't care leaning against anything I can lean against. But hey, they don't need personalities because they use radical abbreviations like Uncle D. Ah, oh, gee, what's your rap, Uncle D, but we've got a room to clean! Well, if it worked in the Brady Bunch and Sunny Delight commercials, surely your youth must be saying it nowadays. A disgusting sight. Granted, it's not like they've never used abbreviations before. Uh, D.W., uh, could you give me a hand? But something about those initials just has a good ring to it. The stories mostly seem to center around weird experiments, superheroes, top secret missions, pretty much anything they wanted. Which would be great if you wanted to see any of these characters go through any of those. You don't. Because it's fucking Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Yeah, without the incredibly rich duck or the incredibly funny duck, Huey, Dewey, and Louie are not interesting characters. I'd love to see Darkwing Duck go through all of this. I'd love to see the Rescue Rangers go through all of this. But those are great characters I wanted to follow. These are just the Jonas Brothers if even less personality was required from them. So many comic books, so little time. You guys ever think maybe we should quit reading all these comics and do something? Someone's been reading self-help books again. Pitiful. So there's no other way to put it, people. This show is pretty bad. To the extreme! So after their attempt at making has been ducks look cool, they tried something different? Oh, Malcolm, that would indicate that Disney would not be five years behind what's popular. And in the late 90s, they were all about that. Enter the Mighty Duck! Ducks I guess because they knew ducks were gonna be the big trend for a while. Yeah, everyone's gonna be saying ducks rock this year. This will be much better than fish rule or logs are totally radical tubular some. We were given a show based on a movie five years old that had nothing to do with the movie that was five years old. In fact, the connection is so vague that you kind of wonder how the hell they got this set up. It's actually kind of intriguing. Hey, I'm an inspiring show creator and I wanted to make a series based on the Mighty Ducks. The kids with the hockey team? Yeah! I love it! Except, uh, can we make the kids ducks? Well, it is a kid show, so I guess that's okay. Hey, can we make them teenagers because little kids wanting to be teenagers is really big right now? I suppose. Hey, can we have them fighting aliens in another dimension where there's nothing but ducks and hockey is more of a side thing? I mean, that has nothing to do with my idea. But it has everything to do with my idea. I'm glad we found a compromise. Hug me! Uh, we'll pay the price. Oh! And yes, that is the story. They come from a dimension where everything is obsessed with hockey. Heck. Even the asteroids look like hockey pucks because they didn't want to seem uncool. And dimensions are crossed between our world and a world populated by ducks. Oh sweet Jesus, it's Howard the Duck all over again! Quick, hide your squeaking Tim Robinses! <laughs> Once again, the main characters came down to the typical team stereotypes. Except this time, it truly was dated including the stern leader, the muscle, the goof-off, and... You dunderheads can't steal a simple piece of aluminum oxide! Tim Curry? Okay, the only advantage it has is that Tim Curry is the villain. And the only bigger advantage than that was that Tony J, the voice of Frollo, was his second-hand man. That simple piece of aluminum oxide has a very complicated alarm system. Okay. 
I am totally pro Tim Curry and Tony J sharing any scene under any circumstances. The battle is on to see which one of our voices can get women to orgasm first. Well, that should be easy. My voice is ten times deeper. But my voice is so much sexier. I can make the phone book sound juicy. I can wear women's clothing and still be hot. We can even sound sexy saying the most non-sexy thing ever. Ducks rock! God, that really does suck the cool out of everything. My role in Congo is sounding good about now. Like I said, it was stupid, it was painful, it was beyond force, and it was the final nail in the coffin that killed the Disney afternoon. Well, that's kind of a shame that everything ended up going downhill like that. Well, in the end, it really doesn't matter because that's not what people remember the Disney afternoon for. It's remembered for all the creativity, all the comedy, all the colorful characters, all the unforgettable worlds. Everything has to have an end, and at least they went out on such a stupidly bad note, it couldn't be forgotten. The people who remember the Disney afternoon remember it as something to look forward to after school. The shows that were there to greet them after such a long day. And that was its secret. It wasn't badass, threatening, or consumed by what was popular. It was welcoming, friendly, and smart. He realized early on that the way to become popular is not following the rules that everybody else is doing, but redefining the rules. Heck, playing a whole different game. And with all the effort put into these awesome shows, they're still gonna stick with us even years after they've been pulled off the air. Bringing you a well, Disney afternoon is over. Now what do we do? Son, you do your homework right now. Oh, but mom! Your butt is what I'm gonna kick if you don't get to your algebra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta do your homework. <laughs> you too, Malcolm. Mom? That's right, you better get your butt busy right now. You got my mom? I want it to be authentic. Wait, did you get mine too? No, she was all the way out in California and I was too lazy to get a ticket. So I got your grandma. Yo, lady, you be getting your ass into them books, or I'm gonna be getting this fist into your eyes! Well, I got a grandma. Don't make me whack my boot upside the downside of your backside! Wow, she's like the white black grandma we all have. Ducks rock! <sighs> I'm the nostalgia critic, and playtime's over. Go do your homework. While listening to music, because of course it helps you study so much better.